So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first session uh, for day one. So, this is, in fact, the first parallel session of the DHS2 Annual Conference 2023. And we have a very special uh, parallel session today. First time we are having uh, this session on uh, DHS2 Academies, and this session is on equity and inclusion. So, uh, we have two of us facilitating this special session today. I'm uh, Pamo Damarakon, representing the HISP uh, Center at UIO, as well as HISP Sri Lanka. And I'm Marta Vila, also representing the HISP Center. Right. So before we start, uh, we have uh, uh, a few things to inform you, some housekeeping rules. So uh, please be mindful. I think probably you may have already uh, realized that uh, the chairs that we have on the auditorium can be a little bit noisy if you uh, stood up uh, just all of a sudden. So uh, be mindful of that. Uh, so this session we will have uh, for one hour, and in that we will have three presenters uh, presenting us on site here as well as virtually. And we will also have a question and answer session um, uh, as soon as one presenter finishes his uh, presentation. So what we will do is to briefly uh, introduce you some concepts. It will take one or two minutes, and then we'll uh, hear all these fascinating things that we have to listen now uh, from uh, all the three presenters representing different uh, parts of the world. Right, so the two terms, equity and inclusion. So equity uh, refers to the fairness and justice in the distribution of uh, resources, opportunities, and the outcomes. And we have another term, which is inclusion. So it, it doesn't mean the same. So inclusion tries to create a sense of belonging and ensure that all the individuals have equal access and participation. Both equity and inclusion are quite crucial for building a diverse and thriving society that we try to achieve. So DHIS2, being a digital tool, the final outcome of we all trying to implement DHIS2 is to do something good for the society that we live in, and that's what we try to achieve. So uh, the main objective is why we decided to have this very special session is to understand how DHIS2 has contributed to ensuring equity and inclusion in countries. So uh, that basically means like DHIS2, we have so many different use cases and how they're trying to ensure equity across uh, all the implementing scenarios. And then also to ensure how equity and inclusion is established in the community. So the community can be us, us as in like not only the countries that we live in, uh, us as also mean like we all, the DHIS2 community. So to do that, we have uh, three exciting presentations. So we're going to start with, um, as, as Pamot said, we are looking at equity and inclusion from, from two angles, DHIS2 out, how to reach the population, but then also inside ourselves. So the first two, the first one is about the utilization of DHIS2 tracker for child protection services in Malawi, a very interesting case that will open the session. And then we have yeah, the second one is on analyzing, geographically visualizing all the deliveries that are taking place outside of healthcare institutions in Sri Lanka. So this will be done by Nipun. So we will hear like how tracking all these deliveries which happen outside of the health sector is uh, is an interesting case of uh, inclusion. And then the third one is the uh, women in DHIS2 addressing underrepresentation of women in the community. We are very excited to have this abstract presented because it's the first time that this topic is brought into a session in a, in our conference. So let's uh, let's listen what uh, Sharon and Miriam has to tell us from Uganda and, and let's see how can we discuss after. So I think we start with the first presenters. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, with this, we are, uh, we are privileged to have two present uh, Two presenters, one pre uh, presenting here on site and one virtually on utilization of DHS2 tracker in implementation of child protection services in Malawi. So we have blessings here. Um, we'll be presenting on site. Um, yeah, please come forward. And Edith is there joining us online. Right over to you. Yeah, I hope I was, I was sorry. So, uh, Edith, uh, over to you, please. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. Um, apologies, I didn't get the first part of the his presentation, but as um, Edith Chinyumba from Ministry of Gender and his blessings from Ministry of Health, we are presenting how we Malawi utilizes DHIS2 tracker in implementation of child protection services. So our study is based on a premise that investment in human capital through health, nutrition, education helps people to acquire skills that can help them to be uh, to utilize them in future. So as an introduction, Malawi has a population of 19 million and 51% of the population. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, yes, thank you. So Malawi has a population of 19 million and 51% of the population is made of uh, people less than 18 years old, which are children. So because of that, uh, strengthening child protection is critical to promoting child protection and development that can help in attainment of human capital. Now in Malawi, there are uh, several categories of child vulnerability ranging from poverty, poor health and nutrition, abuse, violence, neglect and ex exploitation and displacement that in usually happens during disaster settings. Now, uh, according to a violence against children study in 2013, uh, about half of girls and two thirds of boys have experienced physical violence. And again, a quarter of girls and a fifth of boys have experienced emotional violence, while a fifth of girls and a seventh of boys have experienced uh, sexual abuse. So, um, next slide, please. Thank you. Now, uh, because of um, all these issues, the Ministry of Gender, Community Development and Social Welfare uh, has an integrated information management system and it's within the system that has the National Child Protection Information Management System. So the system was developed in 2016 and the objective was to capture information on child vulnerability. This is to, for, for the data to be used in decision making and in also to provide these services uh, that can go to children. At the end of the day, we want all the children to have the opportunity to grow their human capital potential. Now, since 2016, uh, we can say that the, the system is not fully functional. It's only covered in 57% of the country. The system also has several challenges uh, that makes it uh, a, a bit expensive to maintain. And also we only use the system by the government. So other stakeholders outside the government are not using the system, which means it's not covering and aggregating reports from all the stakeholders. And we can't have a national picture of what is really going on when it comes to children. So because of that, uh, we came up with a meeting with all the stakeholders in child protection system. So we, through the meeting, we reviewed the systems that each and every stakeholder has used. And from them, we made a decision to migrate our child protection information management system to DHIS2 tracker. So we chose DSIH2 tracker because of how interoperable it was and uh, even the price. So we, at the end of the day, we wanted to make sure that quality and timely information is captured, both using uh, offline data collection tools or, or even online, and also that would reduce the cost. And also all the stakeholders uh, will be able to collect data on children. Now, um, this data just shows the uh, the data that is available that was piloted in the two districts. Now, this data was mostly um, leaned towards HIV and AIDS. That's why you see most of the data is on children with an uh, HIV positive caregiver, that is 56%. Then we have 33% of data on children and adolescents living with HIV. 
7% of the data is for children exposed with infants exposed to HIV. And then we have 0.4% uh, uh, survivors of sexual violence and 4% of female child uh, uh, sex care workers. So this is an overview of the data that is available in the two districts that are piloted. But what we're working toward is to include more indicators on children. So our revised system will be capturing the following categories. Next. Okay, so we'll capture health status. The first one was only focused on HIV and AIDS, but this one will have several categories, including other chronic illnesses and also disabilities. We also want to capture education status because most of our vulnerability in Malawi is also linked to poor attendance of schools or even dropouts. We would also want to co uh, cover details of survivors and caregivers because some interventions may link, be linked to the families while in other interventions will be linked to the, um, to the survivors. And the type of vulnerability, we want to capture several categories, including um, children exposed to violence and abuse, and neglect, exploitation, children in uh, child-headed households, children who are in the streets, children in disaster settings. We've had issues recently, two months ago, we were hit with a cyclone, Cyclone uh, Freddy, but we weren't able to adequately capture the details of the children because we didn't have a very dependable information management system, but we would also want to capture that. We would also want to capture children in child marriages, and we want to be able to link it to the services that are going to go back to their normal lives and be able to acquire investments in human capital. Uh, when it comes to our roadmap, we've so far had an initial stakeholder meeting. This is where we agreed to come up with this system. When we're done with this part, we reviewed the data tools. As I already said, we want all the stakeholders dealing with child protection issues to be able to use this system. So we were uh, harmonizing our data collection tools. And with that, we developed the first prototype. We used um, a model from Zimbabwe, but we are, we are going to change it to fit our country. So from there, we are in the process of developing the system, configuring the system. We will use a consultant who will configure, test the system. Then we'll pilot it to the first uh, few districts. We'll start with 10 out of 28, then we'll go to other districts. But by September, we want to be able to pilot the first 10 districts. This project will be supported by several partners. So for now, we've mapped out Plan International, World Vision, Bantwana, um, USID, Save the Children, UNICEF, and most importantly, the government of Malawi. But we are still in the mapping process. We'll be able to identify more partners because we want this database to be inclusive in throughout the country. And at the end of the day, we want children to be protected and that their welfare is promoted and they acquire the best human capital investment that the country has to offer. Thank you for your attention. So uh, thank you so much, Malawi team, uh, for uh, uh, presenting us this very interesting case. Uh, do we have any questions for the team from the audience? Yes, please go ahead. Um, do we have? Yeah. Okay. Much more easier. Okay, thank you very much for this presentation. I just have a question. Uh, looking at the statistic, uh, one over five girls are sexual abused. And this is quite, quite um, a statistic that uh, make me uh, think of the policy uh, 
uh, in terms of sexual uh, abuse in your country, in Mozambique? Um, and is this uh, deviability in, your, in Mozambique, uh, I mean, uh, is it easy in the Mozambique to have something like drugs, the circulation of drugs in your country? I don't know something that cause that high uh, data in terms of sexual violence. So I'm quite, uh, it's, I have to, I want to know really what's happened in this country to have this, this high level. Thank you. Yes, uh, blessings, you want to answer? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick that up and yeah, I think uh, Edith can, uh, yeah. can add to that. Uh, I think if you can get closer to the mic. Yeah. Okay, uh, I don't know if you have more questions. Um, I think we can answer this one and then we'll go for the, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot uh, for, the, uh, for the question. So it's not Mozambique, it's Malawi. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, we do have uh, some legislations uh, that uh, guide uh, against the use of drug and substance abuse, uh, but mostly uh, the high levels, uh, there are several other factors uh, that uh, contribute to that, uh, ranging from the education levels uh, and the, some other uh, social factors. Yeah. Uh, Edith, uh, anything to add? Yes, I just wanted to highlight more on the social factors. So we are still working towards uh, addressing uh, negative social norms. So um, these social norms were mostly linked to early child marriages. And because we are going against ending child marriages, so any marriage with a child is also considered as a, a sexual violence. That's why you are seeing uh, most of this. But we are addressing this. We have child-related laws against uh, child and sexual abuse, which are being uh, uh, advocated for. So I think we are working uh, towards increasing information with regards to child protection and child-related rights. Thank you. I think we have one more question. Okay, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I was wondering more how you use DHS2 in following up these children. So, so you have, of course, the statistics of what kind of situations they are in. But can you say also a little bit more how you use the system to follow each single child? Like what kind of actors are involved in the system using it to, in their work to, to help the children? All right, thank you. So um, we, I think we, as mentioned in the next slide, we also link um, the data of the children to the services that are being provided. So if we, so our data is collected at community level using child protection workers. So these, once they collect the data, they will enter in the system and we'll be able to track if there's an issue of violence against children, we'll be able to see if the child was given psychosocial support or if the child is being neglected or they have lost parents, we'll be able to check under the services provided if they've been linked to alternative uh, care institutions, or if the children are maybe being abused, we'll be able to see if the perpetrators have been persecuted. So we mostly use the services that are offered to link to see uh, how, if, how long it's taking for the services to be reaching the children. And if the cases are being completed or they are maybe they may be uh, uh, ignored, so with that we will be able to check which of the areas has that uh, big of a problem, like demographically, which districts or which uh, regions have issues where cases are not being resolved in time, and we can be able to address that uh, maybe through services or personnel or uh, capacity building. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, blessings and Edith. Uh, I think we need to move to the second presentation. Yeah, thank yeah. You. So thanks again. Yeah.
Right. Uh, so next we have uh, Dr. Nipun Dasanayaka from Sri Lanka presenting us on their work around tracking uh, out of hospital deliveries in Sri Lanka. So let's uh, listen to him to understand why out of hospital deliveries in Sri Lanka is a main issue related to equity and inclusion and how they have used DHIS2 to address that. Over to you, Nipun. Hi, Bon. Uh, I'm uh, Nipun Dasanayake from uh, Family Health Bureau, Ministry of Sri Lanka. So I am going to present our use case uh, where we are capturing uh, the <clears throat> deliveries outside the institution, health institutions happening in Sri Lanka. So, uh, so give an uh, idea about the our situation in Sri Lanka. Almost all deliveries, deliveries take place in healthcare institution. Around ninety nine nine percent out of that, ninety nine point ninety four percent are happening under the care of uh, consultant uh, obstetricians. So, uh, but there are around uh, yearly around two hundred to two hundred and fifty deliveries that take place outside the healthcare institutions, and. Uh, the, these deliveries has risk for the mother and the baby. And uh, because these deliveries are done mostly by uh, untrained uh, persons. So there is a risk for mothers and uh, uh, babies. And as a country, we promote uh, all deliveries to happen in the uh, healthcare institutions. So for these 200 to 250 cases, there may be, uh, we are suspecting there may be cultural and there may be geographical related causes that they that prevent them going into a healthcare institution rather than going into a healthcare institution. So we have, we have to uh, Look into the research and understand why these things, why these deliveries happen outside of the healthcare institution. That was our need. And uh, practically, uh, uh, we are undertaking this, uh, uh, we are conducting uh, uh, investigate into these incidents by our medical officers. Uh, so we thought of getting this data into a system and using DHS2 as a platform and to analyze this. So to give some background, we are uh, Family Health Bureau, which is the national focal agency for uh, maternal and child care. And uh, there, as I said, there, a, there was a practice to... Uh, 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 to investigate those deliveries, what we did was we were we are having a, a very well established DHS2 platform, which is Electronic uh, uh, Reproductive Health Management Information System (ERHMS2). Uh, uh, in very, uh, it's uh, uh, very robust and the numbers it is. We are using it very well. So we thought of incorporating this uh, into our system to capture these investigation results into the DHS2 so we can analyze and see the geographical locations uh, clearly. And uh, our objective in this endeavor was to capture the geographical locations and relevant details of all deliveries that are taking place outside the healthcare institution so we can uh, see what are the causes that prevent them going into a institutional deliver an institution for a delivery so we can uh, actively actively seek out and uh, resolve those issues those they may be cultural they may be uh, geographical we need to first extract what are the reasons so uh, what we planned was uh, we'll go to this first uh, in sri lanka there are uh, provinces and the provinces there are uh, districts each district is separated into different uh, smaller geographical areas these are called uh, medical office of health uh, officers so each MOH uh, has uh, it is 
divided into PHM areas. PHM areas are the smallest uh, service providing areas, and the MOH is the uh, medical officer who is in charge of this area. There are maybe one or two medical officers for each MOH area. So going back, uh, so uh, <coughs> be the, the medical officer of health of that area is responsible for field healthcare in that area. So what uh, they are, have been, they are instructed to go to that household and do a investigation and see why these deliveries happen uh, in that household or on the way. So at that visit, we have uh, asked them to ca capture the coordinates of that location, that house, uh, into that the, uh, the form. So they go to the house and fill the form at that ho uh, home. Uh, they doesn't go with uh, doesn't uh, they go with their team and uh, they uh, uh, investigate it and uh, pay, fill the paper format and they enter it into the our EHMS two system. So this we talked about so. Uh, these are some. Uh, we started this project uh, around April this year. After that, there were around um, 20, 25 to 50 deliveries out, uh, happened in uh, homes. And out of that, uh, 50, around 50% of the data is entered into our system. Uh, these are some uh, maps, uh, uh, use, uh, data that we have captured. So, uh, one of the Main uses we uh, use cases is uh, is the geographical location. We want to see the geographical location of the household so that we could one thing is we could see the clusters clearly if it is happening in a separate area. More uh, deliveries are happening in a uh, area as clusters. We can identify that area. See what are the cultural barriers that are uh, giving rise to such deliveries and are there any geographical reason for these uh, deliveries happening at home so we we uh, we thought that the, having a map would be uh, you know it will give us a better idea of what uh, what are the look at the reasons so uh, so uh, this is uh, Right. So if we zoom into a case, uh, as you can see, uh, this delivery happens very close by to a major road. So <coughs> this case may not have a transport issue because uh, this is a uh, main road and uh, it is we are nearby to the main road and there are public transport available. So there may be different reasons for this home delivery in such cases, but still there can be uh, home deliveries happening at midtime where public transport is not there. But uh, looking at uh, the geographic location and zooming in, we can see, uh, rule out some, uh, uh, think some conditions that may uh, not be the case. So the lessons learned. So <clears throat> we were able to detail analysis because we have we when we introduced this form into DHS two, we went through it again. We uh, uh, made it more analyzable uh, and more friendly for DHS two data entry. Uh, when we um, uh, uh, convert it from a paper base, the paper base one was not uh, analyzed as uh, it was analyzed paper based cases analyzed uh, uh, case by case. But by using DHS two, we can analyze them as see what are the uh, 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 causes that may are more common and. Uh, uh, this is in still in the uh, uh, starting phase, so we are looking forward to 
extracting new details of cultural or areas, cultural or religious trends that can be uh, affecting the this home deliveries. So for that, we have to identify clusters. The, so uh, uh, we are thinking that the geographical locations would uh, help us to do that. And uh, uh, this was uh, we, uh, the training was done in uh, April, and so far the results and the cooperation is good. One thing is that uh, the medical officers of MOH and their staff is very familiar with our system. So it was very easy to introduce such system. And uh, this is on development event based, uh, event based. Uh, uh, although it is less familiar, but they catch up very easily. So most uh, uh, around, I think 50% uh, of data are out of the deliveries are entered by you know, 50 or 50% uh, around 50%. So it's uh, the, the, their involvement is good. And these are some of the uh, analysis we have done. Uh, we have we can we are haven't got uh, deep into the analysis. We are planning to do it with end of the year, and we are collecting uh, qualitative data also. We are uh, the the MOH uh, the medical office of health is has to give their recommendation in a in the the investigation form as well as in our system. They have to. Uh, give their recommendation. That is a qualitative, or a, they have to write what his idea, what is his, what is his expert is telling him to do. So uh, that we have to analyze that part also to give take into account what are the factors that are that cannot be extracted through the uh, quantitative parts. We have to uh, go through those qualitative parts to analyze uh, qualitative data also to come into uh, do find out new points about this. So in summary, it was uh, it's still in the early phase, but uh, going by the uh, numbers and the response, I think it's uh, uh, feasible to do this and understand what are the reasons for deliveries that are taking place outside the hospitals. And, uh, and by that, we can find out the reasons and uh, address those to prevent uh, the home deliveries. And uh, uh, in our case, I think it is it had been uh, uh, a plus point that we are uh, our medical officers of health are uh, working on DHS two for around five to six years for uh, five to six years. So they are very uh, agile on taking up new programs. But uh, uh, the problems I think we found was one thing was that we introduced uh, this form is in a web-based data entry uh, because the form is very lengthy. So uh, we thought it is easy for them to capture it uh, at that point in a paper base and come and enter it at the uh, the office because uh, there are around 100 and 110 data elements in that uh, our data entry capturing form it is quite lengthy and uh, one thing that uh, goes wrong commonly is that the coordinates coordinates are sometimes they are uh, mistakenly entering it uh, switching. So that thing, uh, I think we have to train them again or give uh, feedback on that. Other than that, uh, they are uh, the Hello, can I? Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Nipun. Oh, okay. Uh, also, uh, I think that's our uh, 
end of our presentation and thank you for giving us the chance to uh, share our experience right uh, thank you so much Nipun from uh, Ministry of Health, Sri Lanka. Do we have any questions from the audience? We have around two minutes. Yes, we have one question. Um, thank you for the good presentation. Um, my, my question is on the maternal and infant mortality rates maternal and infant mortality rates for this particular group. Do, are you able to capture that uh, information? And if you do, how, how, what do those figures look like? And when uh, you... Uh, sorry, I can't, uh, out of my uh, memory, I can't give the numbers because uh, well, I have to do, go... Yeah, it, uh, you might not need to give exact numbers, but probably uh, just paint a picture what, what, uh, what that group uh, basically the need to have these numbers captured why it's so important uh, that uh, i think i have to get into our analysis uh, and give because it's i i can't remember the numbers at not a clue either uh, we have to anal uh, go to our it's in our systems because we are captured in uh, the aggregated numbers are captured in our ERHMS system. So, and we have a, a letter, uh, another flow of data coming for from uh, matter, the child care unit. We have a, a separate unit which are who are uh, analyzing each death, each death of a infant separately. They are uh, uh, conducting a uh, investigation for each day. So there's another unit who is uh, going into the details. They are the ones who are uh, telling the calculating the number. So uh, for that, I think I have to get uh, their numbers, the child care unit's number. Right. Thank you. I think uh, we can have one final question from the audience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the name is Farshas Farshas Far. I'm a scientist in, uh, from headquarter WHO uh, NCD department. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I did, I think uh, you uh, clearly stated that uh, uh, using one of the good features of the DHIS2, but I'm still confused how by look by locating the place of the delivery in the map, you uh, you making sure that no one gonna be behind of uh, leaving uh, leaving behind of the uh, receiving service in the in the institution. I am sure that there are a lot of uh, steps that you are taking, but uh, I didn't see these uh, steps in the presentation. Thank you. Uh, regarding that, uh, one thing uh, we this is uh, the analysis is still in the early phase, so we can't go into the more detailed uh, outcomes or finding uh, uh, looking at these uh, numbers we can't come up with uh, reasons but uh, by if after around there are 250 cases no after populating all these 250 cases uh, i'm sure there will be clusters we have, probably there will be clusters so we can identify that those clusters and see why these clusters are happening they may be cultural, they may be geographical. So if there are geographical reasons, we have to correct those. If there are cultural uh, reasons, we have to uh, fi find out and find the reasons and correct those. So still, because uh, the maps I showed are around 25 cases, uh, but when there are 250 cases, I am sure there will be clusters that uh, need explanation yes i mean uh, the case that i showed i think it's uh it's just, just an example and uh more than single cases uh what we look for is the cluster right uh thank you so much nipun and the ministry of health sri lanka right so
But I think uh, next what we have is a kind of a self-reflection of, of us, right? <laughs> Well, it is not from us. About us. About us. Ay, ay, ay. So let's get out of here. Can you put the microphone on? This is better. You can hear this. This one. Okay, so the next session is about, can I present a PowerPoint? Yes, Women in DHIS 2, we are really thankful to Miriam Acheng here from the System Administrator from the Ministry of Health in Uganda and Sharon, it's, poet, it's online, it's a Health Information Systems Analyst from the School of Public Health Makerere and Makerere University. Are you going to be presenting or is going to be... Uh, or both. Okay, so we are going to need help from Simona to see what we have to be doing uh, switching because they are both going to present. You start? Or? Okay, then this. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Mata has mentioned, um, my name is Miriam Cheng. I'm a systems administrator with the Ministry of Health Uganda. Um, my role in DHIS2, I mainly support uh, in server ma management, um, end user support and system support to the country. Um, so for the women in DHIS2, we are looking at addressing the underrepresentation of women in DHIS2. Okay. So um with achievements of the DHIS2 in a span of um, three decades, uh, we observed that the women representation is still um, wanting across um, development, um, sub-administration, customization, and use of the software. And so with that, we look at uh, a couple of statistics here. Um, in STEM as a whole, um, we have only 30% of um, jobs in the tech industry being held by ladies. And in Uganda, Makere University, we, we had just about 12% of, of women being enrolled for software engineering and computer science. And then also across the DHIS2 um, his networks, we still observe that um, the number of women repre represented is still low. And most notably, this year academy, we had um, the Integration Academy in Rwanda and the DHIS to serve academies. Both had um, about just 8% of, of women representing um, in a total of 100, over 100 participants that attended the academy. Then also um, in the different, um, at the Ministry of Health Uganda, where I'm from, we have just about 11% of women uh, in the Division of Health Information and ICT. Uh, HISP Uganda, we have just about 36%, that is around eight women in a total of 22 staff. Um, then again, in, in Uganda, uh, we have just about 36% um, of women being represented across country. And these are the district health teams, the biostatisticians across over across the 146 districts in the country. And uh, in the Makere University School of Public Health, we have only 25% of women represented. Again, the, across the different HISP networks, this story, these statistics um, 
seem to align. Look at Rwanda, we have about just two women among 72 staff being ladies. So um, I'll call over my colleague, Sharon, who is online to give us the current situation, why this is the case, and also present on some of the solutions that we've... Sharon, over to you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Miriam. Hello, everyone. I hope you're able to hear me. Um, yes. yes, we can. Thank you very much. My name is Sharon, Sharon Aboe from Makere School of Public Health, MEDS Project. I am a systems analyst. And um, like Miriam has said, um, so our situation right now, we've, we have seen that um, there is underrepresentation. And so we asked ourselves what could be some of these factors that contribute to this. And so some of the factors that we found to be the causes of this uh, underrepresentation are the gender stereotypes. I will use an example of Uganda, where I come from, where we come from. The gender stereotypes or biases discourage girls from pursuing any STEM-related or tech-related education or careers. Um, you will hear things like, you can't do this course because it makes you look like a man. How will you work long hours and then support a family? How will you be a mother when you are working such long hours and coding? And while some people might be able to be able to hear these verses and still go on, uh, we've noticed that a bigger scale, a bigger um, chunk of people or girls are actually discouraged when they are continuously hearing such. Um, next. Then we also have systematic barriers like discrimination and bias in hiring practices and workplace culture. You will notice, for example, that um, as we've noticed in our country, that when jobs are advertised and, you know, it's general, and for example, they are looking for like a software developer, the ladies that apply for these jobs actually fewer, they're relatively fewer than the men. We recently had a case at my workplace where there was an advertisement and only four about, out of about 40 something candidates were women. And sometimes it's because of these barriers. If say uh, we were like really serious and then we, 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 we were um, intentional and said for this place, for this job, we want a woman so that we can have balance because it's not just about uh, representation per se to just have women there with the men, but we know that the two different minds think differently. And so we know that if for example, a product is being worked on or developed, the two contributions would actually re uh, create a system that's um, that relates to everyone and is easy to use because everyone has something equal to um, contribute. Next, please. Um, so we also have noticed that because of the stats that uh, Miriam began with, there are really very few role models for these women and these young girls to be able to look up to and say, um, if these many women are doing this, then maybe I too can do it. And um, because we know that almost everyone is inspired to do something at some point, there is somebody who um, who kind of makes you either like something or get curious about something to do something. But so role models are really, really key. And we've noticed that because of those stats of ladies being few in tech generally, that there are few uh, role models or, you know, maybe uh, maybe they, they are not seen by these women or these younger ladies. Next, please. strategies so um we, we we have then thought about strategies if we are saying that us as dhis2 um we have maybe the capability to 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 help out and to create these spaces for women what are some of those strategies 
that we can um, engage to, to make sure that this underrepresentation is no more or it is reduced. Um, so some of these strategies uh, could be uh, what we came up with, uh, what we, we, we saw that could work would be, for example, increasing uh, women's engagement and recruitment in the HIS2. Um, because if we increase that, then we can go out there and, uh, and inspire the other women. And, but then we also uh, notice that this has to begin with us, the community. Um, then also uh, we, we think that if we make these opportunities known, um, then it will encourage the women out there. For example, in Uganda, uh, Miriam and I have seen that we can collaborate because we are within Kampala. But there is a woman out there in some of the districts that might not even know that some courses exist online, the HIS2 online courses, or that there are some training opportunities. And so we think that um, apart from just encouraging them, we think that we could also bring these opportunities to them. We could make them known to them. And so then they can be encouraged to apply. But we also think that um, on the point of hiring, we think that if we could just maybe come up with short-term courses where these women can come in and do something short-term, but learn some something like an internship, but to that effect, so that they have, because most of these people actually do not have any hands-on. They are probably just, um, of course they are end users, but even the role they have in there is really minimum. And so we think that if we increase this, they would get these opportunities and then they could um, go on and get skilled. Um, we could target like outreaches and have groups of women from DHIS2 go out to universities and schools and speak to these young women and encourage them. And because then that would be, uh, we would be like role models to them. And then we could speak to them, encourage them about generally technology, but also to show them as um, testimonies to say, so to speak, to say that, in the HIS2, there are opportunities and you too can do them because here we are doing these things. And because we know that overall, this is really to improve a lot of things. Before it was just HIV and health, but now we know there is education and many other things are coming on board. And so we truly believe that this could encourage them and um, encourage them to like look forward to doing some of these things. Um, on top of this, we could also do mentorships where if we go to speak to them, we then can go back to see, to look at what they are doing in the system and how we truly really can be of help to them. But we also think that um, because we know that this gap isn't existing only on the outside of DHIS2, but we know that even within there is a sort of a gap, we also think that encouraging first and foremost women within the HIS2 to, 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 because we know there are great women in the HIS2 who have done amazing things, but if we came together and um, encourage one another and exchange skill, this would also build this community and make it bigger and then we would then be able to reach out to the outside world. Um, maybe also one thing that we noticed was that even the women with um, end user, there are very few that are back end coding and really uh, producing and, and, and writing code to, to, for the systems. And so we think that if the community encouraged Sharon, women... Sharon, Sharon I'm, I'm sorry, we are going to need to finish sharp at 2 p.m., which is like in two minutes. And you have still three slides. So if you can pick your key last message, unfortunately, there is another session. Thank you so much. Peter. So I, I think this can actually be done. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so. so um, for the Ugandan case, this is one, um, this is a, a room full of women and some two gentlemen. 
um, <laughs> on, <laughs> yes, um, with our mentor, Dr. Frospa, we worked on a project, um, Health Facility Quality of Care Assessment Program, which is used to do um, assessments for service delivery and uh, standards, the standards of, of quality um, the, for, for these services. So um, it was entirely women-led, and um, right now there is actually an ongoing assessment in the in in the country. Um, but as you can see, all these women, we have all these women in the room doing the support for it. And um, so, in conclusion, with the establishment of um, women in DHIS, so we are looking for more collaborative, creative innovation and innovations that meet the needs of women. And um, we hope that that can be realized through this, this network, this team. And it will entail more than just um, breaking of stereotypes, but we call upon all of us to, to be involved as a DHIS to community, to be involved in our different his groups. Let's, let's encourage our women to participate, to take up more technical roles in DHIS to and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think I speak in the name of the HISP Center and all the HISP groups and organizations here in saying thank you for bringing up this topic from the field, from an academy up to here with the support of both and different uh, parts of the chain. It's the first time that we bring up this topic in a conference and in a session like this. Unfortunately, we moved it to the third um, presentation because we were hoping to have an exciting discussion and we don't have time. Okay, thank you. So I don't know. I, I, we wanted to assess the appetite for this kind of thing. It's obviously needed. We know the problem is not or the issue is not only DHIS2, but we are DHIS2. So we need to see how can we, his groups, his center organizations, help in, a, in, a, in an issue which is deeper than Little girls don't like computers. We, we all know that starts there, and we all know there is a lot to do, starting by myself. So I wonder if this is can be a reflection for us to either during this conference, because we didn't have time, or in the next one, ensure some space for women in the HIS2. I think Christine wants to say something, and I cannot say no to that. <laughs> because she's a powerful woman. Just, just to continue what uh, Marta was saying, I really think that this should be the topic for our uh, mingling today. That started six. We'll start six thirty. So we will come back to you, uh, uh, our two new friends that brought bringing up this very important uh, topic. So I really think we should continue the discussion today, and we will find out something that can uh, maybe address uh, some of the issues. This mentorship program is a good idea. We could think about other good ideas. So please, uh, can we can we talk about it during the, the pizza and beer and wine and mineral water? And then we come back to you uh, as soon as possible. We normally we are fast <laughs> so we are <laughs> and agile. So we will think about something. It can be uh, addressed in a more institutional way than just talking. Thank you. Okay? okay. I think NCD is there. Brian is here. Th thank you to all presenters.